Hi, Robert here with another episode of the Observation Deck. This week's episode looks at the world of giant trees, mammoth insects, longer lifespans and accelerated healing. This is a journey of the science behind these aspects. The efforts to hide the truth while we travel back into the midst of our culture and memory will be uncovered. Why did our ancient ancestors have such long lifespans? What contributed to the accelerated healing we no longer have? And how did those ancient trees get so big? In an attempt to describe the pre-Diluvian world, we look at how much water engulfed our world and, if the calculations are correct, where did all that water come from? And what the heck of tomato plants got to do with it all? All this and more in this week's episode. One world, two histories, our pre-Diluvian legacy. See you on the other side. Hi, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Observation Deck. In this video, I will be discussing the pre-Diluvian world, what it had to offer, what changed, and is there any evidence for life to have been larger in every aspect of what we see today. Let me start with a few examples of what have been discovered by many researchers who claim trees the size of mountains and beyond once existed, which, by any stretch of the imagination, could have you thinking these claims are too fantastical to believe. The fossilised remains of trees, at least the shape of what could be seen as trees, scatter the world. As you can see by these examples, the evidence is quite compelling and indicates the presence of such life forms which defy contemporary opinion. And yet, there it is, hidden in plain sight, but written off by academia as pure fantasy and fiction. The most obvious examples of larger than present life, of course, are the fossil records of dinosaurs. And one can clearly see the size of these creatures compared to today's animals is astounding. From air, land and sea, everything was larger than present life forms. If we turn to the types of insects, we see again larger than life examples of huge insects. These examples have been found all over the pre-Diluvian world. This is not the musings of the fantastic, but clear fact of nature, and yet isolationist study of history pushes us to keep all these examples separated from each other. If we turn our attention to the sea, again, we find the same things. Giant creatures swimming in the oceans, living, breathing titans of the deep, existing on a world which clearly had the capability to support these life forms. And, if you have seen my episodes on human giants, there's a link at the top right hand corner there, you would know it extended to our own ancestors. We clearly have two specific clues to consider. The first, we can safely say everything was much larger than present day forms of life, and the other is that the time slot in which these examples lived. Could we have had the trees the size of today's mountains? In order to understand how the clear-cut evidence of gigantism that once existed on our world, we have to look at the conditions to which they thrived. What sort of environment was needed to promote such wondrous sizes of life, and what were the environmental factors which sustained all life on Earth? For the environmental factors to support this type of life, certain things have to be in place. First, the atmospheric pressure had to be far greater than it is today. Second, the balance of what makes up air has to be different from what we currently experience. The following is a small extract from Wikipedia. Since the start of the Cambrian period, atmospheric oxygen concentrates have fluctuated between 15 and 35% of atmospheric volume. The maximum of 35% was reached towards the end of the Carboniferous period a peak which may have contributed to the large size of insects and amphibians at that time. But again we find defence of the contemporary view that this may not have been the case, when in fact experiments show the opposite. So first let's pop over to the wiki I just quoted and read a little bit more and then over to another site which says otherwise. 
So here we are on the quote I just made, which is this one here. The large size of insects and amphibians in the Carboniferous period when oxygen concentration in the atmosphere reached 35% has been attributed to the limiting role of diffusion in these organisms. But here's where we go. But Han Haldane's essay points out that it would only apply to insects. However, the biological basis for this correlation is not firm and many lines of evidence show that oxygen concentration is not size limiting in modern insects. There is no significant correlation between atmospheric oxygen and maximum body size elsewhere in the geological record. Well, clearly they haven't looked at dinosaurs and uh, dragonflies with six foot wingspans in the fossil records. But I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. I just want to pop over to another site which kind of contradicts this one straight off the bat, which is this one. And it was quoted by science, no less. High oxygen levels spawn monster dragonflies. So it kind of contradicts the ones we've just seen. Biologists have grown supersized dragonflies that are 15% larger than normal by raising the insects from start to finish in chambers emulating Earth's oxygen conditions 300 million years ago. You can imagine generation after generation after generation what size these dragonflies would be and as you will see later the fossil record clearly shows that the wingspan is six foot on some of these dragonflies so it kind of proves the opposite of the wikipedia site there so let's just get back to the question at hand so how do we know oxygen was far in excess of what we have today? Well, a lot of research has been done, but one of the areas that uh, was most interesting is that the readings were taken from the analysis of air bubbles trapped in ancient amber from various parts of the world and clearly indicate the oxygen levels that existed in a pre-flood world. Even National Geographic states from 2011, Dragonflies the size of modern seagulls ruled the air, and it has long been a mystery of how these and other bugs grew so huge. The leading theory is that ancient bugs got big because they benefited from a surplus of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. And remember, that's National Geographic. So again, Wikipedia, you need to rewrite your uh, editorial. As you can see, the ancient world was a different place in so many ways, and none more so than the mixture of gases that made up our atmosphere. Just to give you some idea, the Earth's present atmosphere, there is 78% nitrogen and only 21% oxygen. Obviously, we've got argon, carbon dioxide, which mix, mix with very small amounts of other elements. Our atmosphere also contains much less water vapour now and a lot less oxygen levels and they are still dropping. It is obvious that in order for plants and animals to grow to such sizes, increased air pressure and an abundance of oxygen is clearly needed, as we will see later with experiments conducted by leading research scientists. Many researchers talk about the magnetic field of the earth and how over time it has reversed on several occasions. What is not widely spoken of is the variations in the strength of that magnetic field and this too is an integral part that requires that is required for the growth of sustainability of gigantic life forms. It is also clear from writings in several religious books that humans or giants lived much longer lifespans in this pre-diluvian world and much shorter spans after the generally accepted flooding which caused a cataclysmic event and a reset of the entire planet. The final bit of this pre-flood jigsaw is that our world was protected from harmful UV rays by a barrier of some description. Many cite the word firmament, direct from the biblical text, and has been translated into the idea of a dome covering the world. In point of fact, the translation seems to have had its origins based on pre-Christian view of the cosmos, which was copied into our current system via Egyptian cosmological beliefs, which has added confusion to the original Hebrew scripts. So, in order to ascertain what could block harmful UV rays, we have to go back to the original source material in an attempt to understand what could have protected humanity from the sun's harmful effects on our DNA and adds to the destruction of our cellular structure, which we now call aging.
So let's just head over to a website and try and understand where this idea of a barrier came from. So here we are on a theological site who is much more qualified, this Gary uh, Vatilus, than I in quoting Bible texts. So let's just read what he has to say. And the question he asks is, does Genesis the first teach the sky was solid like some critics claim? And exactly what does the original Hebrew say? And he goes on to say, critics of the Bible have often said that the writings of Genesis reflect an unscientific view of the universe one that reflected the cosmology of the ancient world. One of these criticisms centers on the Hebrew word rakia, used in the creation account of Genesis I. Several Bible versions, such as, King, uh, such as the New King James translation, translate this word as the firmament, and you probably are familiar with that particular version. He goes on to say that, however, other versions of the Bible, such as the New American Standard, translate rakia as expanse and not firmament. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. It sounds like we were living in the middle. And so it was. And God called the expanse heaven. But which is the correct term to use, and where, and this is the interesting part, people, where did the word firmament come from? The Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures produced by Jewish scholars in the 3rd century BC at the request of the Egyptian pharaoh, and that's important there, translates rakia into the Greek word ser, uh, stereoma, which connotes a solid structure. Apparently, the translators of the Septuagint were influenced by Egyptian view of the cosmology, which embraced the notion of the heavens being a stone vault. After all, they were doing their translation work in Egypt for the Pharaoh. You're not going to cheese off your paymaster, are you? But, goes on. Later, this Greek connotation influenced Jerome to the extent that when he produced his Latin Vulgate around 400 AD, he used the Latin word firmament, meaning a strong or steadfast support. The King James translator merely transliterated this Latin word and thus was born the firmament. He goes on as well, but the important thing, obviously, he quotes here, we must remember that the context always determines the meaning of a word. So, um, scrolling down here, the context of Genesis makes it clear that Moses intended his readers to understand rakia simply as the sky, or atmosphere and heavens or space, above the earth, as even the sun, moon and stars were placed in them. In fact, in modern Hebrew, rakia is still the word used for sky, and there is no connotation of hardness. So therefore, he goes on, Genesis 1 is perfectly worded for what the author wanted to communicate. It says nothing more than God created the sky and its constituent elements, while remaining completely silent about what those elements were. And it really depends upon where one starts. If one starts with the presumption of a solid dome, one will read that into the text. However, if one starts with a modern conception of sky, the text permits that understanding as well. And hence, there is no contradiction. So there we have it. The firmament was obviously from the Greek pharaoh who had a different view of cosmology and the sky or expanse, which is used in the New American Standard Bible, translates rakia in its purest form from the original Hebrew. I'll leave all you people to make your mind up of exactly what they were talking about. But personally, I would go to the original source, meaning sky or expanse. So we have a barrier of water and it could have been made up of ice, so there could have been a solid component to it. And I suspect there was, but we have water, liquid water and vapor, which we obviously see as clouds, mist or fog today. But the biggest difference was the Earth did seem to have a solid upper atmosphere, a shell of water which filtered those harmful UV rays, leading to a less or almost no destructive um, effect on our cellular, make cellular makeup.
So our pre-flood world environment is set. The major factors were approximately 30 to 35% more oxygen, almost double to what it is today in terms of atmospheric pressure. UV light was blocked by a barrier of water or vapor and the Earth's magnetic field was much stronger. None of these factors seem too far-fetched to believe even if we do not fully understand the reasons for them to be in place. So let's get into the reasons these factors are of great importance to the ancient surface dwellers and all life forms of all descriptions. And let's start with the density of the atmosphere. It is clear from the use of hyperbaric chambers that our doubling of atmosphere has significant health benefits and allows the saturation of blood plasma with high concentrations of oxygen, which aid a rapid recovery period. And, as many know, this is used extensively in helping divers balance the transformation of micro gases when completing deep dives, as well as the opposite when high mountaineers are coming back down to sea level. But there are other advantages they were also noted. According to the ancient text, Earth had waters below and a considerable amount of water above. Whether that be in pure liquid form or gas or a combination of both, in liquid form this water barrier would have had in liquid form this water barrier would have had several effects on our environment the first being it would have acted as a shield for many of those harmful rays we spoke of earlier it would also have had the ability to create an enclosed biosphere with an even spread of water vapor and most importantly devoid of the weather conditions we see today in fact one could say that there was no weather as such and plants were watered from the morning mists and animals drank from rivers of fresh water. I would go so far as to say as there were no actual oceans as we know them or understand them today, and very little salt in the waters since that requires the rain to strip salts from rocks and deposit them into the oceans we now have. The world was a balance of fresh water and land, and much more land than we have today. So much more. A very different world indeed. This pre-Diluvian world was what we could call paradise. It is also interesting to note that humans and animals alike, mentioned in various ancient texts, lived well beyond our current lifespans, which points towards us having shorter lifespans rather than them having longer ones. Theirs was the norm, not ours. There weren't any seasons since the moon had not yet arrived to knock off the access of the planet and was perpetually engulfed by a canopy of water vapour. That pre-flood world had perpetual harvest of giant fruits to sustain all life. Imagine that, a world where there was absolutely no need for a capitalist system of barter since everyone had access to the same abundant resources. Not only did this pre-flood world have none of the weather patterns we see today, since the earth was not yet tilted off its axis, that is, as I said, until the moon arrived, but since the Earth had not yet ex experienced this extinction-level event, there were no mountain ranges which now contribute to the disruption of airflow and, and water accumulation. There are many historical references to go back to the idea that the Earth in its pre-flood days did not have a moon. And in order to show this, let me just take you over to our next website. So here we are on a site that's entitled The Earth Without the Moon. And it cites quite a few of these, so uh, I please forgive my pronunciation ahead of time, but I'll read it as follows. The period when the earth was moonless is probably the most remote recollection of mankind. Democritus and Anaxagoras taught that there was a time when the earth was without the moon. Aristotle wrote that Arcadia in Greece, before being inhabited by the Hellenes, had a population of Plagasians, Plagasians, and these Aborigines occupied the land already before there was a moon in the sky above the earth. For this reason, they were called Proselenes. Apollinus of Rhodes mentioned the time when not all orbs were yet in the heavens, before the Danai and the Deucalion races came into existence. And only the Arcadians lived, of whom it is said they dwelt on mountains and fed on acorns before there was a moon. 
Pluchard wrote in the Roman Questions, there were Arcadians of Evanders following the so-called pre-lunar people. And similarly wrote that the Arcadians are said to have possessed their land before the birth of Job and the folk is older than the moon. And it goes on and on and on, recording that the moon had not yet sat up in the sky. The memory of a world without a moon lives in oral tradition amongst the Indians. The Indians of the Bogota Highlands of Colombia related some of their tribal reminiscences to a time before there was a moon. In the earliest times when the moon was not yet in the heavens, say the tribesmen of Chipchas. There are currently three theories of the origin of the moon. One, the moon originating at the same time as the earth, being formed substantially from the same material, aggregating and solidifying. Two, the moon was formed not in the vicinity of earth, but in a different part of the solar system and was later captured by the earth. And three, the moon was originally a portion of the terrestrial crust and was torn out, leaving behind the bed of the specific. I will mention number four later. All three theories claim the presence of the moon on an orbit around the earth for billions of years. And mythology may supply each of these views with some support. Genesis 1 for the first view, the birth of Aphrodite from the sea, and for the third view, Aphrodite's origin in the description of Uranus, and also the violence of sin, the Babylonian moon, seems to support the second view. But since mankind on both sides of the Atlantic preserved the memory of a time when Earth was without the moon, the first hypothesis, namely of the moon originating simultaneously with the Earth and its vicinity, is to be excluded, leaving the other two hypotheses to compete with themselves. But we have seen that the traditions of diverse people offer corroborative testimony to the effect that in the very early age, but still in the memory of mankind, no moon accompanied the earth. And since human beings already populated the earth, it is improbable that the moon sprang from it. There must have existed a solid lithosphere, not a liquid Earth. Thus, while I do not claim to know the origins of the Moon, I find it more probable that the Moon was captured by Earth. Such an event would have occurred as a catastrophe. If the Moon's formation took place away from the Earth, its composition may be quite different. So, as you can see here, there are absolutely loads and loads of references in a time before the Moon. But the one that I want to focus on now that we've established that there was a time before the moon is that such an event would have occurred as a catastrophe. So let's get back to the video. There is, of course, another theory about the moon, which the article did not cover. And that is that it was more or less parked in orbit by some advanced race to monitor our planet. The exponents of the hollow moon theory, justified by NASA's reports of it ringing like a bell, seems to support this assumption. But whatever caused the moon to be where it is now, it would have caused an extinction level event, or an ELI as it's called, when it came into orbit. This is the single most destructive event in the planet's history that I believe led to a great upheaval and subsequent flood that led to the destruction of the paradise that was. This would have been more than enough to disrupt the water barrier or the firmament, or the dome, or whatever you want to call it, which blocked the harmful rays of the sun, the UV rays, and would have split the continents open like a nut cracking on Christmas Day. This splitting of the continents would have released billions of gallons of the world's underwater aquifers, shooting steam geysers up into the atmosphere, and combined with the destruction of the high altitude water barrier, would have more than likely account for what we call the Great Flood. For 40 days and nights, the waters fell and the seas rose to unprecedented levels. According to the latest surveys, there is still 100 times more underground water than in all the lakes and rivers put together, as we can see here. So, as you can see here, Atlas of Hidden Water may avert future conflict. And although it doesn't give you the map of the world, the bit I want to bring to your attention is aquifers are underground layers of solid rock or sediments from which water can be extracted, normally by drilling boreholes or digging wells. They hold 100 times the volume of fresh water that flows down rivers and streams around the world at any one time. This whole article goes on to uh, describe it all, but that's the bit. So it just goes to show you that that's the water that remains 
underneath the world's aquifers that wasn't leaked out when the catastrophe which i will continue to cover for you as we get back to the website but that is the fact of the matter so to continue when the moon came into orbit the earth must have tilted off its axis causing further catastrophic events which resulted in the near extinction of all life on earth after the deluge our uv barrier was gone the earth was tilted away from the sun which gave us the seasons we now experience weather patterns unheard of prior to the moon's arrival and probably stripped off a large percentage of our oxygen rich atmosphere mountains were formed during this cataclysmic event and the idea of continental drift could be replaced by the splitting of the land along its weakest points driving the land masses apart literally ripping the earth at the seams as for evidence of current patterns of continental drift they too can be included since the weakest points still push magma up from the depths of our earth slowly pushing what was left of our paradise even further apart i propose the drift or continental drift is a result of that extinction level event not a constant natural action in and of itself i suspect the arrival of the moon initiated the process of continental drift but is there any evidence the seas rose to such an extent we know they rose but just how high and we can gain more important clues as to the evidence that sea levels rose far more than was previously thought but more than that i suspect atlantis did not sink rather than the sea rose and covered it which is an important distinction I wanted to know how deep the deepest man-made structures had been discovered and again I found some weak attempts to discredit the fact that these structures throw current ideas into a tailspin. It would seem that academia has no problem in admitting shallow water discoveries and yet will not support deeper research since it goes against the dogmatic, histo goes against the dogmatic historical narrative put out by the established view. Take a look at these examples of a city discovered off the coast of Cuba and see how it is treated. So here we are on historylists.org which lists five of the most mysterious underwater structures and I'm going to do this in reverse order for and reasons will become apparent. So let's start with the um, Pavlo Petri site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site and officially the world's oldest submerged town is located just off the coast of the southern Peloponnese region of Laconia in Greece, which is 10 to 13 feet or 3 to 4 meters below sea level. And it goes on to detail it. But what I want to bring your attention to here is that it, it has no problem. No authority has a problem if you're only talking shallow depths of discoveries here. Another example, the underwater city, and it doesn't even question whether it's a city or not. It just tells us it's an underwater city in the Gulf of Cambay. As the Gulf of uh, Kambat cultural complex is a huge submerged city off the western coast of India. And again, this is 120 feet, 36 meters below sea level. So again, it doesn't have a problem calling it a city because it comes well within the range of sea level rises, as we have been told. This one, again, World Heritage Site, so it's accepted and that's only 10 to 13 feet. But woe be tired anybody who finds something like the Cuban underwater city. Now, notice the difference in language being used. The Cuban underwater city is another underwater structure that raises more questions than answers. See, now it's already sowing doubt. What appears to be the ruins, so it only appears there's not actually ruins of a submerged city with corridors, buildings, including massive granite complexes, pyramids and circular structures, is located off the coast of western Cuba. As much as, and here's the kicker people, 2,000 feet, 650 meters below sea level. That doesn't fit. OK, and this is and, and they go on to say, according to the scientists, it would take about five fifty thousand years for now. It's an alleged city. You see, it's gone from an underwater city to an alleged city to be submerged to its current depth. As a result, many express doubt. I'd like to find out what the list of many is who are expressing doubt that researchers from and get this Canadian company really discovered the lost city. Because, and this, this is what I can't make out, unless my English is going crazy. Unfortunately, 
sonar and underwater video robot images are everything that the reacher that the researchers have so far about the site why is it unfortunate that would be solid proof wouldn't it sonar and video evidence okay but it's unfortunate in this case until more is known it is impossible to say what is down there although the possibility that it is really a lost city cannot be ruled out either so they're just being nice here but until more is known it's impossible to say you notice how different that they treat these discoveries because this is far too deep for the modern academia to uh, in other words they'd have to rewrite history so that's just one example so now let's head over to some of the discoveries made by the research vessels the albatross and the anton brun and check out just how far the waters rose and they did not recede after the flood which will give you some indication of just how much land was around prior to the deluge. So here we are on the website World Truth TV, which is reporting on discoveries made by the albatross. And as you can see there, a city 6,000 feet under the sea. This may be about the most astonishing thing you've ever heard, but a city 6,000 feet underneath the sea, reports Jonathan Gray in his newsletter. The Swedish research ship Albatross had just returned from a peaceful reconnaissance in the South Atlantic. And there's a, an old black and white image of it. Once we get past all of the uh, advertising rubbish, uh, it goes on to say, I swear to you, it's incredible. Do you know, we were sounding the seabed 700 miles east of Brazil and we brought up core samples of fresh water plants. Can you believe that? And do you know how deep they were? 3,000 metres. The speaker was Professor Hans Peterson, who had led the expedition. So we're not talking some neophyte researcher here. We're talking a professor. He added, these samples actually contain microorganisms, twigs, plants and even tree bark. Trees were growing that deep at one point off the coast of Brazil. Another discovery goes on. Within a similar time frame, discussion was hot in London. Coral had been recovered from the depths of over 3,000 feet, over 1,000 metres in mid-Atlantic ocean sites. And we all know that only coral grows close to sea level. So either the seabed dropped thousands of feet or the sea rose mightily. Personally, I will go with the latter. Still another. Meanwhile, at Columbia University in the USA, Professor Morris Ewing, a prominent marine geologist, was reporting on an expedition that had descended to the submerged plateaus at a depth of 5,000 feet. It's quite amazing, he said. At 5,000 feet down, they discovered prehistoric beach sand. It was brought up in one case from a depth of nearly three and one half miles, far from any place where beaches exist today. One deposit was 1,200 miles from the nearest land. As we all know, sandy beaches form from waves breaking on the edge of the coastal rim of the seas. Beach sand does not come, does not form deep down on the ocean bottom. And then he himself, Ewing, dropped the bombshell. Either the land must have sunk two or three miles, or the sea must have been two or three miles lower than now. Either conclusion is startling. So what does this mean? These facts mean one of two things. Either there was a mighty ocean bed subsidence, which I wholly doubt, unexplained by orthodox science, or a huge, likewise unexplained addition of water to the ocean. Well, I've already covered where the water came from in terms of sub-aquifers and obviously from the atmosphere. But here we go. City on the seabed. Now for another surprise. This time excitement was in the Pacific. The year was 1965. The research vessel named Anton Brun was investigating the Nazca Trench off Peru. The sonar operator called for the captain. I don't know what to make of this, he murmured. Around here, the ocean floor is all mud bottom. But just take a look at these sonar recordings. Unusual shapes on the ocean floor. I'm puzzled. Better lower a camera, came the order. 
at a depth of 6,000 feet, a photograph revealed huge upright pillars and walls, some of which seem to have writing on them. In other nearby locations, apparently artificially shaped stones lay on their sides as though they had toppled over. The crew rubbed their eyes and kept staring. Could this really be? The remains of a city under a mass of water more than a mile deep. Was it overwhelmed suddenly by some gigantic disaster and now it was buried under 6,000 feet of ocean? That lost world was like a paradise in many ways and was different beyond our wildest dreams. And yet it was a real world, as real as ours. So there you have it. And you'll notice that none of these discoveries are covered in the mainstream press. And there's a surprise. So how could ancient cities and organic evidence be that far down in today's oceans if it were not for the fact the seas rose incredible amounts, far in excess of what is commonly known or accepted? which it then follows that the amount of landmass in this pre-flood antediluvian world was in far in excess of what we see now. Our current life, it seems, did not evolve in these present conditions. It survived the previous. It does seem we have even more evidence of an extinction level event unprecedented in human history and miles of water were added to our once fabled paradise. That paradise that was, and the cataclysm that followed, created the world we see today. But I wish to go a little further into the world that gave us mile-high trees, enormous animals and giant insects, so it's, since we have yet to use modern science to back the claims of these alternative views. How can we check and make sure our pre-flood environmental assumptions are correct? Well, again, Dr. Carl Barr of Glen Rose, Texas, has set out to build the world's first hyperbaric biosphere, 62 feet long, and its purpose is to simulate the context of this original world. An engineer from NASA has called it the greatest experiment in history ever performed in the name of science. And as you know, hyperbaric chambers are used by divers and hospitals to aid rapid healing, which is why our ancient ancestors had no need for today's drugs or system of hospitalization. The enclosed hyperbaric environment saturated the body with increased oxygen and increased air pressure by a factor of two, mimicking our ancient biosphere. Biosphere. And to add credence to the idea we humans had longer lifespans and enjoyed amazing health benefits, we're going to pop over and take a look at what happens when we duplicate the planet's pre-flood atmosphere. So here we are on a website called Rehab Mart, Caregiver University, and this article was written by Mike Price OT, so I presume OT is occupational therapist, so let's just get straight into there. I'm not going to read you 13 interesting facts, just this first section. Hungarian-born physicist Edward Teller, form, former science advisor to President Reagan and the father of the hydrogen bomb, suffered a stroke at 74 years old. His doctor, a man named Richard Neubauer, Neubauer told him about an alternative medical treatment that could restore his mobility, improve cognitive function and give him back his health. Teller accepted Neubauer's treatment recommendation and recovered almost immediately. The treatment recommended by Dr. Neubauer was administration of pure pressurised oxygen. According to Edward, the remnants of his stroke passed away within the first handful of therapy sessions. Edward's wife suffered from lung problems and she too found relief from her condition after ongoing exposure to the pure pressurised oxygen. The name of the treatment Edward Teller received would come later be known as hyperbaric oxygen therapy, also abbreviated as HBOT. HBOT is an FDA approved medical treatment which in which 100% pure oxygen is delivered to the patient through increased atmospheric pressure in an enclosed chamber. And you can see that types of chamber here. So if you want to buy one, you're looking at three and a half, four thousand dollars plus. Uh, where were we? When oxygen is delivered at pressures higher than normal, and they weren't normal in pre-diluvian, they were normal pre-diluvian as it is, it dissolves and pushes deep into the blood cells, blood plasma, lymph fluid, 
and cerebral spinal fluid. Following his initial experience with h bot Teller was so impressed by the effectiveness of hyperbaric hyperbaric therapy that he purchased his own chamber for home use oh i wish we all could it is said he spent an hour inside every single day until his death at the age of 95 so what was he he was 74 when he suffered a stroke and he went on to 95 not a bad innings edward teller and his wife were just one of the many testimonies illustrating the benefits of hyperbaric chambers hbot has come a long way since it was first introduced as an alternative to traditional medicine and now exists as a form of treatment in over 1500 of 2000 hospitals nationwide so what they're doing here whether it be design or accident is mimicking that pre-Diluvian world. So it's even more believable now that research shows everything was larger in the past. And it's said that the club mosses, which reach 16 to 18 inches today, often approach 200 feet in the fossil record. So those trees I showed you right at the start of this episode could well have been like a scene from Avatar with mother trees scattered all over our world. This too would have created a canopy of protective shield against harmful UV rays pushing the aging process away and may have been utilised to create some of our greatest inhabitable natural cities. I just wonder if the writers of Avatar knew something that we didn't. The filtering of harmful rays slowed the breakdown of cells and tissues and led to a much slower aging process, which is why we see those long lifespans prior to the Great Flood. For additional evidence, one can look at today's lifespans of those living at the equator against those in the north and southern regions, which have less UV rays, and the statistics are clear, as you can see here. And here we are on uh, Wikipedia's list of countries by life expectancy. Now, I'm not going to dive through all of this, but um, you can see that the darker areas are the lower, which is obviously these areas received most of the sunshine. But if we look at this small image over here, you can see that all of the lower ones, here's the male life expectancy at birth in years along the bottom and the female up here but if we have a look at the life expectancy and we we'll just go to about halfway you can see that all of these all of these appear at the equatorial area um, we can bring that up so you can see it much better Afghanistan hot country Zambia Somalia Uganda Congo Nigeria Ethiopia these are all sitting where the highest UV rays are so it kind of speaks for itself really from the book, The Scariest Book of All Time, was quoted back in 2012 and states the following. To oxygenate the deep cell tissues of giant life forms of all designations, we need much greater atmospheric pressure. Research has shown that when you approach two times today's atmospheric pressure, the entire blood plasma is saturated with oxygen. This would mean we add an excess of energy, more stamina, and could run 200 miles non-stop without getting fatigued. Such atmospheric pressure would also promote rapid healing, as you've seen from those hyperbaric chambers. It goes on to say, in the 1980s, a hammer found inside a rock that was analysed by the Battelle Laboratories in Columbus, Ohio, the same laboratory that analyses moon rocks, by the way, the elemental analysis showed it to be 96.6% iron, 0.74% sulphur and 2.6% chlorine. Now, physicists tell us that under today's atmospheric conditions, you cannot compound chlorine with metallic iron. And yet, there it is. Today, chlorine can only be joined with iron as a solid metal in only in two atmospheric pressures of oxygen and only in the absence of ultraviolet radiation. So that proves both points that I've said previously, which points directly at a world which had the ability to filter most, if not all UV or shortwave radiation and backs the assumptions of a thicker atmosphere as previously claimed. 
One of the best examples showing the advantages of an increased atmosphere and oxygen saturation with the additional filtering of UV light is actually from Japan. The results were extraordinary to say the least, extraordinary to say the least, and supports the claims of the Earth having trees that practically touch the sky. So let's head over to the work of Dr. Kai Mori. So here we are on the website that talks about uh, giant tomato plant by Kai Mori, Dr. Kai Mori, a physicist from Kyo. University in Japan worked with a cherry. Now remember, this is the smallest one, a cherry tomato plant that started in his basement. He gave light to the plant with a fiber optic cable which filtered out UV light, a process called Himawari sunlighting. He also added pressurized CO2 in a gasket around the stem and the root system. At some point, his plant was moved to a greenhouse, which also simulated these conditions. Within two years, the tomato plant had reached 16 feet tall with 800 tomatoes. 16 feet tall cherry tomato plant. Okay, in 16 years, it's reported at 45 feet tall with 15,000 tomatoes. It was further reported that under these conditions, the tomatoes would stay green until they were picked. So you can imagine that if it was 45 feet tall in 16 years. And remember, tomatoes perhaps last maybe one or two seasons at most. This thing simply didn't want to die. All right. So and then it goes on. Pre-flood Earth. These two conditions, no UV light and increased carbon dioxide and atmospheric pressure, are suspected of being part of the pre-flood atmosphere of Earth. This experiment gives a possible glimpse into how the pre-flood world could have appeared and why so many plants, animals and even people were long lived and able to grow to large sizes. So there you have it, folks. Let's get back. So if you were to calculate the size ratios based on that tomato plant and use that as a base measurement for all other plants, you can easily calculate just how big a redwood would be compared to today's trees and for all the other species. So from this alone, it would seem plausible those giant trees would have existed, especially if there was no one to chop them down as we do today. Damn you, Ikea. I mentioned the importance of an increased magnetic field, and with good reason. The chemical difference in the electromagnetic field has an astonishing effect on toxic bites from insects to snake bites. It breaks down the venom into harmless protein that the body can use as fuel rather than life-threatening poison. It was reported in the New York Times, taken from a peer-reviewed medical journal, The Lancet, that when treated with increased electrical activity, snake bites, irrespective of type, can be quickly treated. Here is a report citing that publication. So here we are, as you can see, on the website of the New York Times. And uh, although it's chatting about the archive, let's just go dive straight into it. A chat in a London laboratory between an American missionary physician who practices in the Amazon and two tropical disease experts has led to a new electric shock therapy that saves the lives of snake bite victims, but that defies scientific explanation. The treatment is delivered through modifications of what are popularly known as stun guns. It comes in the form of four or five high voltage, low current electric shocks. Each is painful and lasts one to two seconds. The shocks are given about five to ten seconds apart and are applied as close as possible to the site of the bites of the snakes and such venomous insects as scorpions and ants. In 34 cases where there was evidence of ven venomous bites that had penetrated the skin of limbs, the current was applied within half an hour. None of these usual serious medical complications developed and none of the patients died. The researchers said in a report on what could become a revolutionary treatment. Also, the pain of the poisoner's bite disappeared within 15 minutes, according to the report in the July 26th issue of The Lancet, a leading medical journal published in London. 
So I've jumped straight across to another website because, as usual, there's a complete contradiction. And yet we've just read from a peer-reviewed medical journal in the New York Times. And this one reads, Copperhead season, what not in very large letters to do if bitten. And without going into too much detail, they're talking about Copperhead season. I didn't know there was one, but I presume there is. And it tells you not, in other words, do not apply a tourniquet, do not apply ice or use an ice bath, do not cut the wound, do not use any form of suction, do not give the victim alcohol or drugs. And this is the bit, do not give the victim electric shock. So I will leave you to decide why there is such a contradiction in this because obviously it goes against a peer-reviewed medical journal one advice says one thing one advice says the other but we've also seen from research work that and not just on steak bites but um, on all sorts of other bites that electric shock treatment as i told you on this site in 34 cases i'm not going to go into it again um, that it works so why do you think this article is telling you not to do it i'll leave you to decide so as you saw there a pattern of debunking emerges whether it be from underwater discoveries at depths that don't fit the current paradigm to using electric shocks to treat snake bites uh, spider bites scorpions all sorts of bites and I think, I suspect, it's to protect uh, investments rather than explore innovations. Further evidence shows that the electromagnetic field influences the body in incredible ways. In fact, it affects everything from molecules to man, and without it, cells cannot divide during the process of mitosis. Evidence suggests this much-needed field was not only stronger in the past, but may have even held steady before the flood thereby creating a healthier atmosphere, which fits perfectly with the disruption and the arrival of the moon. The increase in the magnetic field would obviously have included a higher electrical charge within our atmosphere or our environment. In the research of Jonathan Day, he writes, new evidence is showing that electricity can be a cure for all kinds of venomous bites, including bees, spiders, mosquitoes and snakes. Snake venom is made up of mainly proteins and enzymes which are chemically bonded together and therefore make them impossible for your body to assimilate in any beneficial way. However, electricity breaks those bonds allowing your body to take in the protein and it turns out to be beneficial to you. So in the pre-flood world, if you were bit by a snake... It wouldn't affect you because of the higher electromagnetic field, the electricity or the static in the air. Also, the wound from the bite would heal much faster because the higher oxygen and atmospheric pressure would aid that accelerated healing we spoke of earlier. The evidence of, for the use of in earlier. The evidence of, for the use of increased electrical stimulus is also reported in the same journal as saying, the brown recluse spider is one of the most horrid of all spiders. When you get bit by a brown recluse spider, it literally rots your flesh down to the bone. One 10-year-old girl bit by a brown spider, a fiddleback, was zapped on top of the bite while being grounded underneath the bite under her armpit. In 24 hours, it was all gone. The Oklahoma State Medical Journal recorded that from September 1988 to September 89, 21 cases were confirmed where a brown recluse spider bit bite had been zapped for treatment and in all cases were cured within one treatment, which was reported by Osborne on page 9 of that journal. Given this evidence, it may shine a new light on the use of the Baghdad batteries and could have been used as a medical treatment rather than to power anything else or be used as an electroplating device. Could those batteries have been a type of non-evasive surgery? It seems very likely this could be the case. Now we know about those nasty little snake bites, and I suspect, as it's mentioned previously, it works for scorpion bites too, especially in that region of the world. So, before I conclude, please consider supporting my work by liking, subscribing and sharing this information with anyone and everyone you feel fit to. 
And for the price of a cup of coffee, you can help me keep this channel going via PayPal, Patreon and Bitcoin, all of which are in the description below. With that being said, let me have your attention for just a few more. Combine all of the evidence you have now seen and we may have the answer to why not only plants were larger in the fossil record, but animals as well. It appears nearly everything was larger and healthier in the past. Dragonflies had wingspans up to 60 inches, cockroaches were a foot long, bison stood 10 feet at the shoulders and the saber-toothed tiger stood 6 feet at the shoulders. Meanwhile, plants, which are only 20 inches high today, were 120 feet as seen in the fossil record. I am convinced those gigantic trees of old existed and the evidence of man-made structures discovered miles under the oceans show how much water was dumped in just over 40 days and how far the seas have risen as the earth split at the seams. The efforts of contemporary science to ignore such evidence demonstrates a world with two histories, one that claims it has always been this way, the other less accepted that we lived in paradise in harmony with the world and its many inhabitants and lived to incredible ages and grew to enormous size. The real question is, why would such a distortion of our past be maintained? And that is the question I leave you to ponder for yourself. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Observation Deck and come back for more by subscribing and hit that bell for notifications. So, until next time, question everything, believe nothing and stay curious. See you on the other side.